Hello and welcome to the History of Clothing Design at m and I'm Katie and I'm part of the team at the m and Archive in Leeds. If you're watching the preview of this talk, I'm here to answer any questions just in the chat on the right hand side. Otherwise, just drop us an email at archive at marksandspencer.com with any queries. In today's talk, we'll start by taking a look at the process of clothing design at m &S. So how the design department worked and how it's been influenced through the years. We'll then look into how m &S has collaborated with other designers and its place in the wider design industry. First, I wanted to start with a quick introduction to the archive and to the business more widely. So the m &S archive is based in Leeds we hold over 72,000 objects telling the story of m &S. and the collection includes clothing, food packaging and homeware, lots of merchandise that m has sold through the years, as well as the business records of m &S. The exhibition is open to the public and the archive collection is available for visitors and researchers to explore and find out the impact that m &S has had on the social history of Britain. The m and story begins in 1884, when Michael Marx, here on the top left, set up his first market stall in Leeds. Ten years later, he went into partnership with Tom Spencer on the right, and m and was born. Our first market stall sold haberdashery and household essentials at a time when most people would be making their own clothes. Everything on the stalls was priced at a penny. The business soon expanded away from market stalls and onto the high street, and then the range of products increased. We first began selling clothing in 1926, as the demand for quality and affordable ready-to-wear clothing increased more generally. We have very little information on the design process in the 1920s, but a 1946 quote from Eric Heim, who was head of textile design, gives us an insight into the early years. He said, in the old days, the buyers of women's dresses were shown by the manufacturers a range of garments in a variety of prints and styles. Their only choice was to take them or leave them. So not a lot of flexibility in those early days. The photograph here shows our Stockton store in 1927. And you can just see on the left hand side there, there's clothing, including men's tunic shirts for sale. As our textile business increased into the 1930s, we started selling more garments and our ranges grew. The business knew that it was essential to keep abreast of fashion trends and to be able to offer a better choice of designs to customers. Here we have two photographs in the 1930s. On the left, a 1937 window display of dresses uh, entitled Inexpensive Frocks at 2 and 11. And on the right, you can see a 1939 store display. Chemist Eric Kahn had joined the business in 1935. And although he was responsible for textile technology at m and he saw technology and design as inseparable. And so while he was setting up a textile testing laboratory, he was also instrumental in setting up a central design department in 1936. This was followed by the print design department in 1939. On the left hand side, you can see this design department in the 1930s. And on the right is our textile laboratory at a similar time. Following the war, we recognised an increased interest in design by the general public. In 1946, the Britain Can Make It exhibition was held at the v &A Museum. The exhibition was organised by the Council of Industrial Design to promote industrial and product design in Britain. In our training news bulletin, a staff magazine, we commented on the exhibition, noting that only a small proportion of manufacturers had sent in exhibits. We said, the rest have completely misread the public mind. They fancied that the subject would only be of interest to a minority of specialists. We went on to say that the same could be said of many retailers. However, m had a policy of steady improvement in quality and design. 
We work closely with manufacturers on research and design and recognise that customers were becoming more design aware and taking more of an interest in the products that they were buying. The photographs here, we can see Sheffield store on the left in 1949 with that wonderful fashion section at the back. And on the right hand side are some examples of garments that we hold in the archive collection dating to the time just around um, throughout the war and just after the war into the late 1940s, showing these really beautiful prints and patterns um, and garment design that we had at the time. By 1946, as a contrast to the earlier practice of being offered designs by our suppliers, our designs and garment patterns were sourced either on buying trips to Paris or were produced in-house. Once prints had been agreed, the fabric was given out to the manufacturers to produce a small experimental order. This would be a few dozen dresses that were trialled in a few stores. The war had affected both supply and demand, so raw material shortages caused supply issues. But rationing and make do and mend campaigns meant people weren't buying so many new garments. So our design department had to try to predict future trends when demand would inevitably increase. In 1946, new designs were being introduced to stores before the demand for the previous range had subsided. But this was done with an eye on the future when we said the demand for novelty can be expected to rise dramatically. The image here is taken from a 1947 staff bulletin and it gives sales information uh, gives sales assistants information on the design process and then it goes on to advise how they can improve display and sales of the garments. The chap on the left hand side here is Hans Schneider. Now he joined M&S in 1949 as head of women's wear. He was a former refugee from Vienna and he was hired to upgrade merchandise following wartime restrictions. Under his direction, our design department expanded rapidly from just eight people in 1949 to over 70 people by 1967. The team included print designer Elizabeth Tomalin, whose work on printed textiles contributed to the success of women's wear in the 1950s. And by the 1960s, the department were working a year in advance. Each of the designers in the team was also a technician and a fully qualified cutter. Other designers in Hans Schneider's team included Monica Duberry and Re Rebecca Bannerman. They're here on the left. They're shown here with Princess Elizabeth of Uganda. So the princess was in the UK to model at a fashion show at which M&S was showing garments. She was shown around the design department by the two designers and later headed over to our Pantheon store for a bit of shopping. Another royal visit to the design department took place in 1971 when Princess Margaret was shown around as part of her head office visit. She's shown here in this photograph with Hans Schneider on the right and our chairman J. Edward Seif is on the left. Garment designs were also submitted by manufacturers who had their own design departments. So clothing ranges would include a combination of our own in-house designs and those of our suppliers. In 1967, for example, 90% of lingerie designs and 75% of skirt designs were created in-house. Around about 40% of dress, de dress designs would have been developed from ideas submitted by manufacturers like Cora, a big supplier to M&S. They had their own design room working on garments for M&S. In 1970, we actually worked with Cara to open their design and development centre, which supported a team of 50 garment and fabric designers. The images here show aspects of the design process through the years. So on the left, we've got pattern cutting and on the right, designing and pattern cutting in the 1970s. In the 1974 feature on our design department, we said, no matter how much he may feel like it, the m and designer can never follow a whim and create something outrageous. He and she are part of a team comprising selectors, fashion consultants and cloth technologists. So any new design has to be woven into what the team has decided for the season. The process in 1974 was quite similar to that in the 1940s. 
Fabric was ordered in by selectors and technologists after rigorous testing and wearer trials. The designers then worked out the basic silhouettes. For example, skirts might have three shapes for the season, pleated, flared and flippy. Then any trims would be decided. The designer would begin sketches. For every 100 sketches the designer submitted, at least 25 would be rejected. But then these sketches form the basis of the range, which would be constantly reviewed before samples are ordered and the range would be finalised. Here we can see the design department in 1974 and some examples of our menswear and womenswear the same year. I want to show you some film footage now. It gives a bit more detail into the design process and how the partnership between M&S and Cora worked. This shot excerpt is taken from a 1979 documentary which goes behind the scenes at M&S head office. April 1979 at Michael House in London, headquarters of Marks and Spencer. Dress designs for the spring and summer of 1980 are already on the drawing board. The Marks designers are aiming at a massive but elusive target, popular taste. Crepe dresses had sold well over the last two years, but the latest spring fashion shows had suggested that the range needed a new look. Peplum. A confident early runner was the peplum dress, a 40s style with padded shoulders and peplum waist. I think it's very important that here that we these middle price lines are fashion garments uh -huh. and that our more expensive ranges are in fact investment buyers are much more classic. I think we've learned from this year that uh, that's the way we've got to go. Although Marks design dresses, they don't make them, but their suppliers, and they have 24, do both. Coras of Leicester get two-thirds of their business from Marks. They're also planning a year ahead. Coras agreed with Marx that crepe dresses would still be good sellers in 1980. For the new look, they nominated an idea from continental fashion shows, the use of brightly coloured stripes in dresses made of T-shirt cotton. And we've taken the block stripe. Oh, yes. Yes. Into a full-length dress. Yeah, being a little bit adventurous here, bearing in mind that they have asked for a rib top and we've shown it as a, as a complete dress, but I know B should feel strongly for it. <laughs> yes. Any other stripes, Laura? And then a 50s dress, which again is possibly a little bit too young for them, very with a the scooped out back. Do we have any other necklines or...? Yeah, they're very keen to follow up this line. As a rule, Marks and their suppliers adapt the big sellers from previous seasons. The film Grease had made this T-shirt top a bestseller in 1979, Add a woven skirt to make a full-length rib-top dress and you've got a good bet for 1980. Into the 90s now and by 1996 we had 30 in-house designers working on clothing and home. And our top six suppliers employed 270 designers between them working solely on designs for M&S. So it's still a real partnership between suppliers and manufacturers and M&S to come up with those designs. Our colourists worked two years ahead assessing colour and fabric trends. They said it's our job to find the balance between certain looks and fabrics and whether it's an appropriate time to sell it as a retailer. Here we can see the women's wear design team in the 1990s on the left hand side and some examples of men's and women's wear from 1996. Today, designers are working with new technologies in predicting bestsellers and understanding trends. And digital samples are often used, which means there's no need for physical sample garments to be sent backwards and forwards between M&S and manufacturer. For example, in kids and women's sleepwear, we now buy full ranges without ever making a physical sample. Our design teams continue to work closely with our technical teams to ensure that garments are not only stylish and great quality, but also that they achieve consistency of fit. I now want to take a look at how our designers have found inspiration and what their influences have been through the years. As early as the 1930s, we were taking inspiration from across the world. So Parisian designers were employed in our 1930s design department. And in 1938, we were purchasing printed fabric designs direct from Parisian studios. We said at the time that business could be very much stimulated by the introduction of really genuine designs produced by a Paris artist. The prints on the left here are taken 
from some 1930s garments that we have in the archive collection. Uh, the bottom two are from some um, dressing gowns, some artificial silk rayon dressing gowns, and the top print is taken from a pair of beach pyjamas. In 1946, Miss Keane from the design department reported back after a buying trip to Paris. She said, very few of the models could be used as they are. The tendency is towards very feminine, draped or frilly styles, which would only appeal to a sophisticated exclusive taste. The trip, however, gave her ideas to modify the classic styles popular with the majority of shoppers. By the end of the 1940s and under the direction of Hans Schneider now, the department studied fashion trends, they took window shopping trips to Europe, and visited trade fairs. The article on the right here is taken from a staff magazine in 1954. It talks about the new jersey wear range in colours that the selectors have brought back from the salons of the world, from Paris, from Rome, from Zurich, from Brussels. The article was accompanied by a photograph of Jean Hutton, who was a selector in the department, um, and she'd taken the Golden Arrow train to return from her research trip to Paris. Hans, uh, Hans Schneider himself was very open about his influences. He's here on the left hand side again. He travelled to shows. He watched Balenciaga for the more classic traditional style. He watched Yves Saint Laurent for more boutique trends. According to the journalist Prudence Glynn, m and designs bought from Dior or inspired by Balenciaga cost shillings, yet retain that certain Kelka shows that cost so many pounds in the Avenue Montan. In 1955, Hans said, m has to watch fashion trends very carefully and while not lagging too far behind, must not rush up with the avant-garde. On the other hand, as the line changes and a new silhouette emerges, m must keep abreast with the times. So Hans's team travelled to Paris, Switzerland and Italy in search of ideas and fabric that could be used or adapted. They travelled to the twice yearly shows of Dior, Givenchy and other couturiers bringing back their ideas. On the right hand side here we can see an m and fashion show from 1968. And this international influence continued especially as m and expanded internationally. So our design team in the 1990s worked with our newly established international office for clothing and homeware. So it was really beneficial having these local offices the team researches and forecasts the major fashion statements 14 months ahead of the selling season, using the knowledge of its internationally experienced designers, we said. The team had a network of design consultants as well, including people like Paul Smith and Betty Jackson. Designers visited international fabric trade shows and the business subscribed to trend prediction organisations like Trend Union in Paris. Our head of women's wear design, Sheila Brown, said, it's our job to find the balance between certain looks and fabrics and whether it's an appropriate time to sell it as a retailer. Here we can see our designers at work on the left hand side in 1996 and on the right there's an article with um, Betty Jackson and she's giving her top five pieces for 1995. Another source of inspiration for our designers is the MS archive. So this is a really unique source of inspiration for our designers. Design teams regularly visit to explore vintage garments or marketing materials. They help inspire future collections. For example, to celebrate our 125th anniversary in 2009, designers explored the archive collection and created a collection of men's and women's wear inspired by vintage pieces. You can see three of the dresses from the range here. The dress in the middle the print is taken directly from a 1950s nylon dress that we have in the collection. In 2016, the archive was used extensively in a collection where we collaborated with the author and model and designer Alexa Chung. So she delved into the garment collection here at the archive, discovering classic m and design. She reinterpreted her favourite garments from the archive. These included pieces including um, a 1940s man's shirt and a 1930s satin dressing gown. Uh, the coat that she's shown wearing here was inspired by school coats from the 1960s. And then 2021 saw the arrival of m and Originals. 
This was a range of menswear inspired by the archive and designed in collaboration with our sustainability team. So the designers looked at garments, including 1960s polo shirts, 1990s chunky knits and t-shirts in the 1970s, before reimagining them and redesigning them using the most responsible and sustainable methods possible. So we've looked at how our designers were influenced by couture, by street fashion and vintage M&S. I now want to look at the external designers that M&S has worked with more formally, either collaboratively or as advisors. Arguably one of the most successful consultancies began in 1962 when Michael Donnellan, who was known as Michael of Carlos Place, started working with M&S. Michael was an Irish-born fashion designer who had headed the House of La Chasse in the 1940s before running his own couture house in the 1950s and 60s. Journalist Beryl Hartland commented at the time, the rich woman goes to Michael for his elegance, beautiful making and scissoring. The not so rich get his know-how too in clothes from Marks and Spencer. Michael was seen by the Times as the most perfectionist of London designers in 1966. And possibly as a result of this, Marks and Spencer made it into their absolutely in list of the same year. We can see in the photographs here, Hans Schneider and Michael uh, at work in the design office. And in 1969, we enlisted designer Sidney Brent as a menswear consultant. So Brent owned the Take Six boutiques in London including one on Carnaby Street, and his role was to advise on various points of fashionability in menswear. On the left hand side here, we have two images taken from the Young St Michael range, launched in 1970. And we don't know exactly what Sidney Brent worked on, but it may be that he was responsible for some of the outfits in this collection, possibly even these midnight blue velvet flares in the middle. In the 1970s, our men's suiting benefited from the input of Italian tailor, Angelo Vitucci. Vitucci was known for his own menswear label, Angelo Roma, where he created suits for people including Roger Moore and Sean Connery. And his ability to translate extremes of fashion into elegant tailoring made him a really good fit for M&S. On the right hand side here, we can see some examples of men's suits from 1975. In 1988, we employed Bruce Oldfield as a ladies wear consultant. You can see him here on the left um, with the rest of the design team. 1999 saw the launch of the Sartorial Suiting Range, which was designed by Taylor Timothy Everest. And this was the start of a long partnership between M&S and Timothy Everest. He designed the suits for the 2000 UK Olympic and Paralympic teams, which were supplied by M&S in the capacity as team sponsor. And in 2007, he designed the M&S suits for the England Rugby Union team, as well as the England men's football team. Consultancies in the 1990s and 2000s included Julian MacDonald, who was known for his delicate, intricate knitwear, like the dress on the left hand side, uh, Catherine Hamnett and Patricia Field, whose Sex and the City inspired range caused queues down the street when it was launched in 2008. You can see some examples from that collection there on the right hand side. Design collaborations with famous faces have included Twiggy, who worked with us on women's wear collections throughout the 2010s, and Rosie Huntington Whiteley, who we've collaborated with since 2012. And she's recently added a collection of shapewear to her M&S range. Thinking now about our place in the design industry more widely, and particularly in promoting new designers. So Hans was interested in the training of designers at art schools. And he believed that new designers would have a much more rewarding experience working at M&S than they would in Haute Couture. In 1958, he was appointed chairman of the examining board at the London College of Fashion. And this was a role previously filled by Couturiers Norman Hartnell and Digby Morton. 
And this relationship would be two-way. M&S would have access to new design talent, while the students themselves could learn from a major fashion retailer. The photograph here shows Hans um, on the right with Couturier Norman Hartnell and Sam Sherman of Sambo Fashions. In 1969, our swimwear designer, Ilo Sommerfeld, taught fashion students at Kingston College of Art after the students wrote to M&S to ask with assistance with a swimwear project. The students made up their designs using fabric donated by M&S and then presented them to an, an audience of tutors and M&S colleagues. Ilo is shown here on the right making adjustments to a sample. Our links with the fashion courses at Royal College of Art go back to the 1960s when Hans was on the advisory panel to the college. In 1974, our designer Ken Howarth had a design on show at a fashion show to celebrate 25 years of the RCA School of Fashion Design. His dress and shirt were shown alongside garments from other former students, including Zandra Rhodes and Bill Gibb. Throughout the 1980s, RCA students showed their work at exclusive M&S fashion shows and each season the most popular designs from the show were put into production. The garment shown here, the blue dress with the brown top, is from the 1984 collection and our designer Lynn Morris said the garments have been left exactly the way the students designed them. In 1997, our women's wear coordinator, Sheila Brown, was appointed a visiting professor at the Royal College of Art. She was a former student of the college and she maintained contact with the college by mentoring final year students. Then in 2009, students from RCA were invited to submit designs for our limited collection range. Designer Anna Smith was crowned the overall winner and she was invited to produce a full collection for our spring 2011 range. Ten other finalists each had a design in the final range and the collection was launched in Marble Arch store and online during London Fashion Week. And bringing it more up to date, uh, 2024 saw the launch of a nationwide search for M&S's new designer with the launch of a competitive ITV series, M&S Dress the Nation. The series documented the progress of 10 hopeful candidates, all competing to secure a highly coveted in-house junior design role at M&S. And today, innovation continues to be at the heart of how we design and develop products. And with a background that's rich in creativity and inspirational design, the future of M&S design is in good hands. That brings us to the end of our talk today. I hope you've enjoyed taking a look back at the history of design at M&S. Do get in touch if you have any questions. All our details are on screen there and keep an eye out for more online events on our website. Thank you.